Hello guys, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Josiah of Ezurike. I'm here again to uh, present the second video following the series in lattice phase key infrastructure for quantum resistant uh, computing. Like I've always mentioned, uh, I wanted to make you understand why uh, I'm doing this. I'm doing this because uh, I see an imminent problem in our computing world where uh, the quantum computing is threatening it. First, it started with the uh, uh, quantum charging machine and an ideology that came in in computer science as we understood more about the quantum mechanics. Now, it's perverse stuff, it's threatening a whole lot of stuff. And therefore, I'm calling everybody to come on board to help solve this problem. You can't only, you can't just leave it to the mathematicians and the physicists and, and cryptographers and the rest of them. It's a common problem. Security is a common problem. So I'm telling everybody, and I do know that people will understand when they are seeing these in um, day-to-day -day, um, tools like Excel, spreadsheet, Word, and all that. When they start seeing it that way, then they can actually contribute in their own little ways. And today, uh, before we start, I would like to reiterate on what we did the last time. The last time in video one, I was able to show a uh, lattice phase key infrastructure and from the perspective of a practitioner that's doing crypto analysis of uh, the whole um, algorithm. So this algorithm, one more time, I'll try to explain that is an algorithm that took the uh, symmetric and asymmetric um, functionalities in cryptography and put them together to be able to encrypt messages or hide messages whereby only the authorized person can use or read them um, in the form of uh, uh, data and then it becomes information to them once they can read these. So that's basically it, but the most important thing is for you to understand the bits of encryption was really high, but um, eight to 10 times that of uh, what we have today in the sense of AES. However, it's put into properties as one. Well. So as we move forward to get this thing done, I implore you to be a part of it. Um, today we are going to discuss Simon's algorithm or the, the algorithm Simon presented at the same time he also presented uh, 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 a secret uh, S to solve. Uh, after, after he gave the condition to solve them, he said to solve this secret S, which is the unmasking factor. So in his uh, in his algorithm, the proposition uh, very simple. They are conclusive now because it's acceptable and accepted. It's almost like a theorem. So you have a function of n bit strings uh, taking in input, and it's going to bring out an n bit strings of output as well. But the funny thing with this situation is that you have two inputs going in, but only one of the form of the two forms came out uh, um, um, just one of it came out okay and there seemed to be just one one of the same so he's saying that this is this is the condition such that there is a secret string and that secret string is the s i already mentioned is an element of the bit strings and being an element of the bit string also made it possible for any functions that came out of the uh, taking the um, input and putting that input into uh, an algorithm or say a, a quantum Turing machine in this case, which is actually a black box. You don't, we don't know what's going on in there. It should be able to be equal to the uh, another function, which is uh, f of x exclusive OS or f of x x or s so in this case where you have f of x being equal to f of x x or s equal to each other like I've already mentioned that's a tautology so he's saying for us to solve for s so in order to solve for s you have to satisfy certain conditions certain conditions have to be satisfied they are tabulated and then you have to go step by step to solve for s and there will be many iterations I will try to explain it as you can see here in step one you have to do um, you have to set up random superpositions and what you see as an equation is just showing the probability of getting the zeros on one from this random superposition so when this kind of superposition happens it happens when particles uh, start to exhibit 
of certain quirky nature or characteristics where they don't even exist as a zero or one with the signals that they are sending. Instead, that they, they, they exist as um, in between. Not zero, not a one. It's just like when you take a coin and you, you roll it up. It's not a tail, it's not a head, but it's rolling up. Uh, you only know what it is after it might have fallen. So this equation is saying the probability of one being a, of it being a zero or one is given in this format. Okay. So to set it up the way you want this equation, you have to do what they call Hartman transformation, which guarantees that you have that one output. I will take you up to the Excel sheet. I know you understand the Excel sheet, so that way you will see what we mean by that. So now, um, when you look at this whole column, column here, it's a bunch of columns that I put together. Okay, let me one thing. These are binary representation uh, of the x, and over here, uh, this is the state. The state is going from zero to f, which is pretty much 16 bits. Um, I mean, 16 of those, and you have the uh, the zeros represented in uh, four bit strings. Each of them are four bit strings. So the truth table for these four bit strings should be uh, uh, it, ha it should have 16 columns. Okay, so you're looking at a, a matrix of four by 16. So it should have 16 columns. Okay, so that's pretty much it. So that 16 columns is pretty much 16 coefficients. So if you are doing um, three bit strings, it should be eight coefficients and stuff like that. So we have to solve this, okay? So in order to solve it, you have to get the condition intact. The the factor has to be there. It's not a pattern per se, but the factor has to be there. I'll show you. So you look at row nine, and you have you have uh, three, okay, going in into this functional uh, equation. To make it simpler and then you look at the uh, row 14 you have another four string uh, bits four bit strings going in and what's going to come out is this right what's going to come out is what you see uh you're going to see in alpha fx xor s that's what, what's going to come out out of it but i'll show you how that goes in so now you have this this is three but is giving you five and you have this row 14 this is six but it's giving you five that's a relationship let's show you the relationship here so this is a relationship I'll show you clearly you see for this uh for this bit string the first bit bit in the bit string the bit string will be a b c d e that's bit string but the first one the bit string you see that the input s here the input s here is zero and you also have this one to be a zero as well so when you do the xor you still have a zero here so now you see you have the input two inputs row 6, row 14. We assume that this whole thing here are all set up to follow Hadamard transformation. So these are the superposition we're talking about. It's only found in these two to satisfy this condition. Whereby there's an S which you can add here. You do what they call extra, which means you don't carry over the extra one if it's one on one. So one on one becomes a zero. So now here you see this. You have the same. You have the same here. And you also have the same here. There are five. So this is the holy grail. This is where people's eyes started opening that quantum computer with its model can solve problems faster than classical computers. So I'll give you an example. If if you have a, 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 a one million steps to solve a problem in, in classical computers, computers we have today, quantum computer can solve that same problem in one thousand steps. That's how serious the problem is. Okay. From what I have shown you, uh, you've seen uh, how to set up the Hadamard transformation to meet the the condition upon which to carry on the next step. 
The next step will be Fourier sampling. So Fourier sampling or Fourier analysis, you can also do it uh, you, with the scale diagram. You can see how the cur uh, how the line goes. So right from primary school, we already know that if you want to solve, uh, if you have two unknowns, you need two equations. We already know that. So now Fourier sampling, what it's saying here is that from what I showed you before, when you get a function y, which in this case is uh, f of s, s of s, if you multiply it by s, it has to be in 0 or 2. What does it mean by 0 or 2? It means you can either get a 0 or you get a 1, which I can show you here. So from the relationship I, I showed you already, let's take the second um, bit on uh, same first uh, bit string, 4 bit strings. The second one, you see the relationship, the s, input s is 1 here. And in the, in the case of uh, x, the input here is 0, and s is 1 here. And you use this s to x to 0, and you get, uh, a, um, for uh, x, you're going to get a 1. Okay? So, but it's saying now, if you take this, the value that you have here, which is 1, and multiply it by 1, you can get either a 0 or a 1. That's what it's saying. That's for first transformation, as like I said, it's a 1. So if you multiply this one by 1, that is down here. Okay. I think it's a row, 20, row 24 right down here. So you're going to get either a 1 and 0. You can't get a 2. It's not possible to get a 2 in this situation. So that's the... That's the step. That's that step, second step. Let me move this thing a little so we can have time. Okay, that's the second step right there. Okay? So you can do a first sampling and you can repeat the steps uh, for n minus 1, meaning first equation, second equation, or you can start like 10 equation, 9 equation, 8 equation, 7 equation, all the way to the first equation. Like you can see, if you follow that way, maybe you have, uh, say, about 10 sampling or 1,000 sampling, and so on and so forth. It's possible to solve that problem, okay? You can solve the system equation easily by following the work on the Excel spreadsheet, or you can use other methods. This is the only way to help you understand what is going on as opposed to the creation of a really hard scenario, which I could be doing in a lab somewhere at John Hopkins or UC Berkeley. But that's not what you want to see. You want to see something that you can connect with with something that you use on a regular basis. From this insight, we draw a conclusion that's, that there is a corollary from looking at it from, from, from another perspective, from a defensive perspective, you can see that there is a corollary that will help us to stop quantum computers from cracking or perverting any other algorithm or anything that we can come up, whether it's in classical time frame or whether it's in quantum computing time frame. It doesn't matter. That's the way to do it. So in corollary, where f is m bits, take m bits input, which will also result into m bits output. So the reference is made to a bit string output or input. For s, Referring back to um, Simon's algorithm for S, an element of this m bit in string 0 or 1, which in this case we are using uh, for bits, for the uh, quantum bits, there is this another secret, T, which is an element of m bit strings. Okay? So that the function fx is not equal to fx, x or s. If and only if that same function f of s s or s is not equal to f of s s or s x so t s or t not equal to g f of s x or s s or t and s or t and then you continue going all the way down till you get to the last four um, Modular six or much much modular five. Okay, so I'm not talking about the uh, modulus. Modulus is different from modular. Modular is a wrapping technique that we developed. That's what we call it: M5, M2, M3, M4, or whatever. 
So here we are representing that here to follow Samus algorithm, what he was saying. We are representing it in opposition to what he was saying. So we can see clearly there's a way to solve the problem that came upon us.